This is You and the Law on AM650. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to You and the Law. And uh, Scott Stanley and Kevin Gurley from Murphy Batista in studio. I'm Sterling Fox. And boy, we're just right in the middle of a whole lot of insurance issues. Murphy Batista is a Vancouver law firm that represents individuals against insurance companies. Both of my guests have played, uh, well, worked both sides of the fence. Both Kevin and Scott worked for major law firms that represent insurance companies and crossed over to Murphy Batista to represent the little guy against these big outfits and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying I'm trying not to sound too cynical here but there's this urban myth or maybe not Scott about cycles in the insurance business payout cycles for example it's held that you are more likely to get a claim paid out early in the year in say January or February than you are later in the year like November December first is it true and secondly if it is why well, that's my experience. Um, when, well, let's put it this way. When it comes to sort of settling personal injury claims, a lot of those get settled November, December, because I think they want to clean up the books. Okay. But when it comes to denying claims, people that are making insurance claims, their house floods or their house burns down, and that it happens to happen in November, December, I find, my, my experience is, is that a lot of those claims get denied at that point of, view, at that point of the year. And I suspect the reason might be is they just don't want to have that on the books. Um, when they close their books at the end of the year. Whereas conversely, a lot of the claims in the early part of the year, January, February, tend to be accepted. And I think that might just be in a little, uh, an accounting exercise to doctor, well, not doctor the books, but to, to adjust. To adjust just, the books. Right. And I think a lot of these employees are paid bonuses based upon how they book their losses and book their payouts. Interesting. So that may or may not be an urban myth. How about this one, Kevin? The independent adjuster. You make a claim you've been wronged in some way. You're insured. It's okay. You call the company. I've, I've got my policy. Here's my number. I'd like some, some help here. I've paid my premiums. I'm current. Pay me out. And they say, well, we'll send out an independent adjuster to deal with your claim. Thank you for calling. Yep. Tell me about that person. Well, the independent adjuster, so for example, if your your home burns down and the, you call up the insurance company and they'll send out an independent adjuster, and the vast majority of the time the in independent adjuster is, is good at his or her job and comes out, assesses the loss, makes the recommendation to the insurance company, and they'll pay out the claim. Um, but sometimes I think people take too much comfort in the, the independent side of the independent adjuster equation. Right. I think in probably all aspects uh, of life, you need to look at who's paying that person right follow, follow the money when in which, doubt follow the money right which is ultimately the insurance company yeah so most of the time they do do a good job and the claim gets paid out but you do need to be conscious of the fact that ultimately the the adjusters bill is being paid by the insurance company and they're going to continue to get more work if the insurance company ends out paying pay, ends up paying out less money. So we're we're down to the business of hair splitting here, Scott, aren't we? Which of course is what insurance companies are all about. If they refer to this individual as an independent, uh, then that implies that this person is well, a, you know, a, just a freelancer. Oh, and in fact, they're a contractor under. A contract to do exclusive work for such and such an insurance company. They're independent only by virtue of them not being a permanent staff employee of that company, correct? That's absolutely correct. And for regular folks that are dealing with this the first time and dealing after dealing with this after the tragedy of losing their home, they actually think that this independent adjuster is some sort of arbiter or someone that's going to advocate on their behalf. And yes. it couldn't be further from the truth. Sterling, often what will happen is they'll uh, this independent adjuster, the first thing they'll throw in front of you to sign is a reservation of rights letter, which means you're giving the insurance company the right, this independent adjuster, to investigate whether or not they should pay you or not, but with no commitment that they're going to pay you. And so what the first thing this independent adjuster is going to do is determine whether or not they should be paying you. And depending upon the mandate they've been given by the insurance company who is directing them, they may be looking for reasons to deny the claim. They may be wanting to look if there's arson. They may be wanting to know if you were occupying the home properly. The next thing they're going to do is they're going to have you sign a statement. They're going to interview you. Things can be taken out of context, and they're going to be looking for reasons to deny coverage. That's what the independent adjuster is going to be doing firstly. And only after they're satisfied that there's coverage, then they'll turn their mind to figuring out how much. 
So again, I, I think anyone that's had a situation like this should talk to a lawyer before getting involved in meeting with these independent adjusters. Well, I was just going to say, you know, put your put the shoe on the other foot here. I'm the homeowner or a, or the tenant, and I've got a policy covering me under either circumstance. But whatever, the house is burnt down, and I don't have anywhere to go. I have insurance. I've been paying for it forever in a day, and I'm perfectly entitled to whatever my coverage says I am. But wait a second, this guy wants me to sign something. Sure, I'll sign it if it means getting the check faster. Sure, where? And Kevin, your advice might be, don't sign anything until you talk to a lawyer. Absolutely. Uh, Oftentimes they will ingratiate themselves to you and and be uh, nice. Kind Kind of your pal. They're your pal and they're up front with you. And oftentimes they'll have a series of what seem to you to be innocuous questions. Uh, but the the questions are targeted. There's certain things they want to know that they may be able to use to invalidate coverage with. So you might think that this question, uh, you know, for example, how many times have you been to the house in the last few days? Was the alarm system working? Mm-hmm. Those types of things. Had you changed the batteries in your smoke detector recently? Exactly. Things that you might not understand will determine whether or not you get coverage under the policy. All right. So again, Scott, uh, again, all you as the person whose life has just been really harshly disrupted, all you want to do is get your life back. Where do I sign? I mean, please, just get the checks coming here. I got a, I got a whole life to, to put back together. And so you're saying, uh, you know, I appreciate your, your, uh, you people see people every day at Murphy Batista whose lives have been quite, quite abruptly uh, disrupted and, and in many cases never to return to anything resembling what it once was and yet the all they want is their life back so why shouldn't they sign if that means accelerating the process and that's what insurance companies count on don't they well if you if you looked at it this way sterling if you went to one of these poor unfortunate souls in vancouver that are homeless and you said look if you sign here we can help you all we can give you some money Uh, Most of those people would do that. In a flash. And a person who's had their home burned down finds themselves in that very same situation. I suppose so, yeah, yeah. Sign here, it will help you out, we'll give you some money. So they're desperate, like a homeless person would be. And the one of the things that people don't realize is that when you have insurance, you don't get any money. The insurance company doesn't have to do a thing. They don't have to lift a finger until you provide them with a proof of loss, which is a sworn document saying that you're making a claim This is what the claim is all about. And so they don't have to do anything. And they can later, if they've not done things properly, and you haven't supplied this proof of loss, and most times they will tell you you need to do this. Isn't my house just burnt down proof of loss? No, it does. It's in the newspaper. It's on page three, for crying out loud. It's, um, we live in a legalistic world, Sterling. So unless you've supplied this proof of loss, and it's a sworn statement, they don't have to do anything. And what will happen is the insurance adjuster might help you with the proof of loss, but of course if it's exaggerated and overstated or you've made some mistakes, that can be one grounds to attack or invalidate coverage. Or if you just haven't supplied it, there's a time limit to supply it. If you haven't supplied it, they don't have to do anything. And a lot of the, you know, their, their sins or the bad things they do, they can all be washed away if you haven't submitted this form. And so Everybody that has a situation where they need to make an insurance claim should consult with a lawyer or consult with a private insurance adjuster who represents people just the way we do, but only for uh, people who have claims against insurance companies. They should definitely do that before they they deal with their, their insurance company. Kevin, should your broker be part of that first line of defense in terms of information? The person who sold you the policy, and there's your homeowner's policy, and, and there that pile of ashes is what was once your home. The first person you're likely to call is your insurance agent, isn't it? Yeah, that's kind of your connection to the insurance company. So right. that's usually the first person you'll get in touch with to report a loss, but they're not the proper person to interpret the policy for you and to give you legal advice about it. Will they Will they at least say, well, the very first thing I'm going to need from you is for you to sign a proof of loss uh, form so we can begin, the, at least the wheels can begin to, to turn. Is that fairly standard or is this this form that Scott's just been talking about uh, kind of a mysterious thing that uh, not many of us, I certainly didn't know about? Well, ideally the broker would advise you of that, but it's really the insurance company that should be telling you that and providing that form to you. Um, an insurance broker, I think most of the time would advise you about it. But again, you don't want to rely on your insurance broker to give you legal advice, quite frankly. That's not their role. They don't have to be doing that. A lot of them do because they're 
they well, care about their clients. Well, I was going to say, yeah. in many cases, you have a relationship with your insurance agent. Yeah. The, you know, the, the person that sold you your policy when your little girl was born, and 40 years later, you're still buying insurance from the same guy. So naturally, there is a, there's a rapport, in not all, but in, in many cases. Well, the one thing you have to do is when you have an insurance claim, whether you're being sued or you have, you know, for example, most people that have homeowner's policies, it, it protects them in the event someone sues them, right? Right. You know, somebody say, slips on the sidewalk. On fall, and, yeah. Oh, boy, yeah. that, that say, old chestnut. Yeah. So, and say one of, your, one of our clients slips and falls on your sidewalk, and you get a letter from Murphy Batista saying, hey, our client's injured. Take this to the, the, to the attention of your insurance company. Do it right away. Uh, in any time, any in any case, when a person is dealing with their insurance company and they're aware of a claim, report it, report it, report it, report it right away. Because if you don't, it can invalidate coverage. Uh, let's talk about that. The and, and again, I watched uh, too much American TV, but the term that I'm I'm thinking is statute of limitations. Is that a, just an American term, or do we use that up here too? We have the same thing up here. We okay. have the BC Limitations Act, which is actually being changed on June 1st, 2013. Oh, okay. Um, so there are some changes coming to it, but generally speaking, if you've been injured, you have two years from the date of the accident to uh, to uh, file a claim in court. And that's any kind of injury, whether it's a car accident or a, a work-related injury, or you slip on the sidewalk in front of somebody, any kind of injury, Kevin? Generally speaking, but there are situations where there can be shorter limitations uh, applied. For example, uh, 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 claims against government can have uh, notice periods that are shorter than that. Uh, so you do want to get advice on that. With insurance claims, you need to be careful as well about dates uh, at which, for example, the proof of loss needs to be submitted to the insurance company. Um, so yes, there are statute of limitations. Uh, ours is generally two years for injury claims, but there are potential other barriers that you need to uh, consult on your own particular situation about. Scott, what about a, a situation where you're injured in a car accident and the injuries may not be apparent, maybe not for quite some time? And so, you know, you, you, you sort of, oh, a little stiff and sore, but I think I'll be all right. And many months later, you're so banged up, you go to your doctor and you get an x-ray or a scan, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, this has been awful since the car accident. Uh, as long as it's within two years, can then you still go back and advance a claim for damages? You can. See, when you're injured in a per personal injury setting, you don't have any obligations to the insurance company. You're suing the person, and they deal with their insurance company. So when you're, you're injured in a car accident or you're injured in any other circumstance, you don't have to give notice to the insurance company. Okay. You only have to give notice when you're dealing with your insurance company. In a, in a car accident, in addition to being able to sue the other driver, you also have a right, in most instances, to get benefits from ICBC. And they're, so they're your insurance company. You do have to provide them with notice and fill in some claim forms for them. I'm glad you brought up ICBC. We need to take a break right here, but when we come back, uh, Murphy Batista has uh, been running some ads here on AM650 uh, referring to ICBC and the current provincial election, and we'll find out what that's all about. This is You and the Law. I'm Sterling Fox along with Scott Stanley and Kevin Gorley, and we'll all be right back after this. This is You and the Law. There's more of the show still ahead on AM650.